Water Structures with Stat Connect Edition. My name is Kaushal Agarwal, and I will be moderating today's session. But before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable. So feel free to move them around to get most of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer these questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Please know we do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or bookmark any links that you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link which was sent to you earlier. To access your learning history and download certificate, please log in to Bentley's learn server at learn.bentley.com. You can directly access your transcripts at learn.bentley.com slash transcript. This series contains three bi-weekly sessions covering all aspects from modeling, analysis, and design. If you still have not registered for the full series, we are sending you the registration link using the Q&A widget, using which you will be able to watch an on-demand version of the previous session as well, which was delivered on 12th August. In previous session, we covered modeling templates for rectangular and circular tanks which we normally design in a water or wastewater treatment facility. But in today's session, our first presenter, Sudeep Narayan Chaudhary, will be focusing on seismic, especially in hydrodynamic analysis of water and wastewater tanks, covering the essential part of methodology and application in Stat Pro. Later, we will be joined by our second presenter, Rajendra Bisht, who will shed some light on the importance of sophisticated analysis for designing foundations of these large concrete structures, which incur huge public investment. With that, I'll hand over the mic to our first presenter, Sudip Narayan Chaudhary. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this unique session on seismic analysis of ground-supported rectangular tanks to IS-1893, Part 2, 2014. The presentation on seismic analysis of other tank types like the ground-supported circular tanks and elevated tanks will be done in the Water Wastewater Series Part 2, which we plan to do in Quarter 1, 2022. Another important thing of consideration is that though this title seems to indicate that this is about the water tanks only, the contents today would be equally valid for any rectangular liquid storage tanks. So let us start today's presentation by seeing why the seismic analysis of water tanks or the liquid storage tanks is so important. Earthquake events over the years have brought in disturbing pictures of destruction of liquid storage tanks from around the world. Sometimes it has been the pure seismic events and sometimes it has combined forces with other devastating events like the tsunami. Damage or the collapse of this container causes some major unwanted events, such as the contamination of public drinking water, shortage of drinking and utilizing water, uncontrolled fires, and spillage of dangerous fluids. 
the uncontrolled fire and spillage of dangerous fluids subsequent to a major earthquake event may cause substantially more damage than the earthquake itself. Due to these reasons, this type of structures, which are special in construction and in function, from the engineering point of view, must be constructed well to be resistant against earthquakes. Now that we understand the importance of doing a seismic analysis on liquid containers, the question is how you do that in Start Pro Connect Edition. Well, we do not have anything implemented in Start Pro directly as of now, but for the benefit of users using IS-1893 Part 2 2014 code, the Indian technical team have created an Excel template which would automate the generation of the seismic loading on the container. I know this is exciting. However, before we go into a demonstration of the template and how you would need to specify or modify your stand model, we would like to spend a bit of time explaining the theory and the assumptions that has gone into making this template. But before we start, let me exclusively state the purpose of this webinar. This webinar is to show you the template that we have developed along with all the underlying information so that the template can go a long way in using STAD effectively and efficiently to generate the seismic loading on the rectangular tank. The fluid tank interaction consideration for estimating the hydrodynamic loading of the tank is a complicated mathematical problem. However, based on the extensive studies that have been conducted since the beginning of the 20th century, we currently have simplified the problem by idealizing the tank fluid system into a two mass or a bimodal system. One part of the water mass that vibrates along with the tank mass is called the impulsive mass MI, and thus is represented as being connected with a rigid connection to the tank wall. The other part of the water mass acts almost independently towards the top of the free surface and which causes the sloshing effect due to seismic movements is called the convective mass MC. This is connected to the tank walls with springs of stiffness KC. The impulsive mass acts at a height HI from the top of the base of the tank and, and at HI asterisk from the bottom of the base of the tank. So the resultant of the impulsive pressure distribution would act at that height. Similarly, the convective mass acts at a height HC from the top of the base of the tank and HC asterisk from the bottom of the base of the tank. Now, all of this, MI, MC, KC, HI, HI asterisk or HI star, HC, and HC asterisk or HC star are called the hydrodynamic parameters of the rectangular tank. Now, let us see how these parameters will be calculated for rectangular tank. The Excel template would generate two load cases for each of the seismic directions specified, one representing the impulsive modal load and the other is the convective modal load. You can specify the seismic direction along X or Z or along both those directions. The impulsive and convective mass and the spring stiffness for the convective mass for a rectangular tank is given by figure 3A of IS1893 part 2 2014 code. The value of the ratio of the required mass to the total mass of liquid and the height of the ratio of the product of spring stiffness with the total height of water or liquid to the weight of the liquid in the tank are plotted against H by L or a ratio of H to L where H is the maximum depth of the liquid and L is the internal dimension of the rectangular tank parallel to the seismic force. The corresponding equations for these curves can be found in the IITK GSDMA document and are reproduced in this slide for reference. These equations have been used to calculate the parameters MI, MC, and KC in the template. The height of the impulsive and convective mass can be found using figure 3B of IS1893 part two code, where the ratio of the required height 
to the maximum depth of the liquid has been plotted against the values of the ratio of the maximum depth of the liquid to the inner dimension of the tank parallel to the seismic force. In our case, with the template, we generate the impulsive and convective hydrodynamic pressure distribution along the wall. In our case, we do not really need to know about the height of the resultant. However, the height of the impulsive resultant is necessary for calculating the time period for the impulsive mode. So we have calculated the same using the corresponding condition as given in the IITK GSDMA document and which has been reproduced here for clarity. In our template, the time period calculation for the impulsive and convective modes has used the recommendations in IS 1893 code plus 4.3.1.2, 4.3.2.1, and 4.3.2.2b respectively. For the impulsive time period, the code has recommended a complex procedure where you need to identify a wall in the tank and load it at a height as specified in clause 4.3.1.2 to evaluate the deflection D, which is required in the impulsive time period equation. The Excel templates evaluate the deflection as per the codal specification, and you would note how the analysis engine box would appear as a proof of the deflections being evaluated during the demonstration. The shorter of the convective time period calculated from 4.3.2.1 and 4.3.2.2b is used to evaluate the spectral acceleration. One thing to note is that in clause 4.3.3, the code mentions about the elongation of impulsive time period if the tank rests on soft soil. However, there are no expressions given in this code for the same. There are recommendations for it, though, in the Euro code. So just to let you know that we have not considered the time period elongation in the calculation of the impulsive time period. Once the time period for the impulsive and the convective modes have been evaluated, the template will evaluate the value of the designed horizontal seismic coefficients for both the impulsive and convective modes using the equations shown in this slide. The Z, I, and R stands for the zone factor, importance factor, and the response reduction factor. Now, these values needs to be specified by the user. The importance factor and response reduction factor needs to be specified from table one and table three of the IS-1893 part two code, while the zone factor is as defined in IS-1893 part one 2016 code. The Excel template would calculate the SA by G values using the equations provided in that part of the code. Once we have calculated the value of the design horizontal seismic coefficient, we are now ready to calculate the hydrodynamic pressures that would be generated in the impulsive and the convective mode. So in this slide, we discuss the equations of the code that we have utilized in the template to generate the hydrodynamic pressures. Firstly, this is the equation to calculate the impulsive hydrodynamic pressure on the walls, which acts horizontally. And this is the equation for calculating the vertical hydrodynamic pressure on the base of the tank. This one is used for calculating the convective hydrodynamic horizontal pressure on the walls, while this is related to calculating the convective vertical base pressure on the base. You can see that all the pressure distribution on walls are hyperbolic functions from, of height from the base, considering other factors to remain constant, and the pressure distribution on the base is hyperbolic function of the distance from the center of the base. The way the Excel template has been designed is that it will calculate the pressure at the nodal points and will apply that as trapezoidal plate pressure loads instead, which would vary linearly across a single plate element. So if the mesh size is fine enough, we would obtain a nearly accurate distribution of hydrodynamic pressure. Our tests have shown that a medium-sized mesh produces less than 1% difference in the base shear calculation. There is one point to know about the direction factor that you see in these equations. 
you will not find them in the original equations of the code. The direction factor represents a value of plus one if the seismic acceleration is positive or in the positive direction of the global x or z axis and minus one if the seismic acceleration is in the negative direction of the global x and z axis. The direction factors are put in the equation to produce the correct direction of pressure distribution. So this is a sample of the impulsive hydrodynamic pressure distribution on the wall and the base of a rectangular tank that is generated in start using the template. And this is the sample of the convective hydrodynamic pressure distribution developed using the template in Start Pro. And finally, let us talk about the inertial loads that would be a part of the impulsive modal load case. In this presentation, we have assumed that the tank doesn't have any roof slab, so the inertial loads considered would be that of the walls and the base slab. It would be a very easy task to consider the roof slab, and it would be done in the next version of the tank template. So the inertial pressure of the walls is then given by this equation, and the inertial load on the base slab is calculated with this equation. The negative direction factor indicates that the inertial pressures would be opposite to the direction of the seismic acceleration considered. The inertial load will be applied as a uniform plate pressure loads. These are the figures of the inertial load that are developed on the walls and the base in, the st in Start Pro using the template. In picture one, the wall is parallel to the direction of seismic acceleration, and thus the inertial pressure on the wall act, acts in plane. In picture two, the wall is perpendicular to the direction of seismic acceleration, and thus the inertial pressure on the wall acts out of plane. The inertial pressure on the base is always in plane, as shown in figure three. So before going into the demonstration of the Excel template, let us spell out the assumptions that we have made while making this template. So the first assumption is that the tank is rectangular and is supported by the ground and is over the ground, which means that we have assumed that no part of the tank is buried. The second is the tank may have multiple compartments, but all the compartments would have the same liquid stored. That is, the properties of liquid in all the compartments would be the same. The walls have uniform thickness, so we have not considered uh, any sloped walls, tapered walls, or uh, walls that are having stepped slope. This is from the point of view where we have not considered any vertical component of the hydrodynamic forces on the wall. The wall thickness perpendicular to the seismic accelerations are seen, so it might be quite possible that uh, the walls uh, in the compartment uh, differs from the external thickness of the walls of the tank, but we have not considered that from the perspective of calculating the design horizontal seismic coefficient. There is no roof slab of the tank, so the inertial load of the roof slab hasn't been considered as of now, but we plan to do that in the next implementation or the next revision of the software. The base slab is horizontal, so we haven't considered the effect of the slope of the base slab. The vertical seismic acceleration has not been considered, though we have planned to consider that in our next revision. The tank wall is rigidly connected to the base slab, and finally, the elongation of the impulsive time period due to tank resting on the soft soil has not been considered. With this, we move on to the demonstration of the Excel template. Okay, before we do that, I have a very quick question for all of you. Uh, so it's, um, do you work in uh, water and wastewater industry? It has just two options, yes or no like to know that uh, whether you you, were, you you belong to this industry it will help us uh, again to know uh, the amount of work uh, that we are supposed to do 
for this particular industry. So please answer this question. Okay, and then let's uh, let's begin from where we left. So this is the model that we will generate the seismic loads on. And as you can see, this model is very similar to the model that we had generated in our first session of this series, which was on modeling that was conducted by Kaushal and Aswati. Now, let us try and see what are the various load items that already exist in the model. So we go to the reference load definitions and the primary load cases, and we see that the load items are <clears throat> based on the dead load and the static water loads in the various compartments of this model. Now we'll go into the Excel template to develop the seismic load. Now this is how the Excel template looks like. And as you can see that the Excel template input block has been divided into two distinct parts. One is where you specify the seismic parameters and the direction of seismic acceleration, while the other part deals with specification of the tank geometry. So in the first block, which relates to the seismic parameters, the first parameter that we need to specify is the code. Currently, we have IS-1893 Part 2 2014 as the only option. But in future, we are considering the possibility of having some more international codes in there to develop the seismic loading. The second parameter is the zone factor, which is as per table three of IS-1893 part one 2016 code. And you could see that there are four zone factors, zone two to zone five, as defined in that particular code. The third parameter is the importance factor, which is as per table one of IS-1893 part two code. The fourth parameter is the response reduction factor, which is as per table three of IS-1893 part two code. The soil type is divided into three categories, hard, medium, and soft as per IS-1893 part one, 2016. Now we can specify the seismic acceleration as positive or negative, which actually directly affects the direction factor that we have seen in the equation. So if the seismic acceleration direction is positive, then a value of plus one is assigned for the direction factor, while if the seismic acceleration is negative, a direction of minus one is specified for the direction factor. Now the primary load case number is a number from which the seismic load cases would start. Now let me explain this in a bit more details. So here, what would happen is this template would develop two modal load cases for each seismic direction specified. That is, if you are specifying a seismic load in the plus x direction, it would develop two modal load cases, one an impulsive mode load cases, and one is a convective mode load case. Now, you have to ensure that you specify the starting load case number of that of the seismic loadings so that you create sufficient opportunity to insert any primary load cases in between if you haven't considered. So once you have defined this, we go to the next uh, input block, which relates to specification of the tank geometry. And you might wonder why do we need to do this? Because we have already specified the seismic uh, uh, the geometry of the tank in the in the physical modeler, but uh, why do we need to re-specify that again? Well, the reason is those information that you had uh, given in the physical modeler was used to generate the mesh of the analytical model, but those values were not transferred to the analytical model, so we couldn't read that. So we, you would need to re-specify these parameters once again to have the Excel template get uh, all the necessary information of generating the, uh, the, the seismic load. Now, the model generation 
has to be done for physical murder, though we intend to give more options in the future. future. Now, once you are ready, click on the generate seismic load option to generate the seismic load cases. And you would see that a taskbar would pop up uh, showing the various steps in calculation of the seismic load. So as you can see that the template has started to generate the seismic load on the water tank. And it has started off by calculating the design horizontal seismic coefficient for compartment number one. Now, there would be two design horizontal coefficients that would be calculated, one for uh, the impulsive mode and one for the convective mode. Now, for each of the design horizontal coefficients to be calculated, one has to know the respective spectral acceleration for which one has to know the time period of that particular mode. Now, in case of impulsive mode, the calculation of time period is a bit complicated. And the way you do that is that you have to isolate a wall of, from the tank and then you have to calculate the deflection of that wall, which would be based on a specific loading, as mentioned in clause 4.3.1.2 of the code, that you need to calculate the deflection at a specific height. And based on that deflection, you need to calculate the time period of the wall. Now, the other important thing is that the walls boundary condition is such that, you know, when you isolate that wall, the boundary condition of the wall needs to be such that it is fixed on all the three sides while it's free on the top. So what you could now see on the screen is that it has, STAT has taken a wall, created a new STAT model out of it, and applied the boundary condition of being fixed on all the three sides while the top is free. And then uh, it has created a node at the required height where the deflection calculation is required. And based on that, it has done the rest of the meshing. And once that is complete, it has applied the loading to and then invoked a STAD analysis. That's why you could see the STAD analysis engine popping up. And this would be done for both the direction of the wall to calculate the time period uh, in both the direction. Now, once the impulsive time period has been calculated, uh, you calculate the spectral acceleration. Based on that, you calculate the design horizontal seismic coefficient and based on which you finally apply the hydrodynamic loading on, on the tank. Now, uh, the convective time period calculation, though, is much simpler. Uh, and uh, you go ahead and then calculate the spectral acceleration for the convective mode and finally um, apply the convective uh, or generate the convective hydrodynamic pressures. Now, once that is all of this are done and being applied, you will get a message that the load has been generated successfully. Now, note that um, for each direction, you would get two load cases, one an impulsive load case, where you would have the impulsive hydrodynamic pressures and the inertial pressures, while the convective mode would have the convective hydrodynamic loading. It won't have the inertial loading. So on the screen, you can see that once you get the load generation successfully message, you can click on OK, and you can scroll down to see the time taken for the whole operation. Once this is done, you can get back to the stat profile uh, to check the loads that has been generated. And you would see that the loads uh, in the reference load definition section uh, is much more than uh, what it was before, indicating that uh, the seismic loads were being calculated. We'll see in a moment what are those various items that are being created there. And then if you go to the primary load case, you would see that there are seismic loads, uh, seismic load cases that has been created. Now, we will explain uh, all of what has been created in a minute. 
All right, let us have a closer look at this model now to see what are those load cases, what are those seismic load cases that have been generated by our Excel template. To find that out, we go to this loading option and we start by checking out the reference load cases that have been created by the template. So we go to the definitions and we expand the reference load definitions and we can see that the template has generated reference load cases from load case number 1000 or the reference load case number 1000 and it has started by generating the initial load in plus Z and plus X or for acceleration in plus Z and plus X. So you actually might, may remember that we had specified a positive direction of seismic acceleration in our Excel template and that's why the seismic load has been generated for acceleration along the positive X and Z direction of the global axis. And that's why we have two inertial reference load case, one in plus Z global direction and one for acceleration in plus X global direction. So the reference load that has been created uh, has been generated as uh, uniform plate pressure loads. And as I have said, that the seismic walls that are perpendicular to the direction of seismic acceleration would have out of plane pressures applied to them, while the rest would have the in plane pressure applied to them. Now, the next items that are generated are the hydrodynamic loads, and it has been generated again for the acceleration in both plus Z and plus X. In addition, it has been generated for two modes, one for impulsive and one for convective. And finally, there is one more categorization where this, con this uh, hydrodynamic loading has been generated for each compartment. Thus, we end up with 16 reference load cases, one for each direction, for each compartment, and one for impulsive and convective modes. Now, the reason why all these load cases were created separately is to give the user the option to check out the individual loads that have been generated in each cases if he wants to. So let us, for example, try and check out the impulsive load for seismic acceleration along the Z direction. So let us select reference load case number one, 1002. And um, we can see that for seismic acceleration along the positive direction of Z axis, uh, along the positive direction of Z axis, uh, for, and this is for compartment number one only. See, you, you mentioned there, if you look at the reference load case title closely, you will see CMP1, which refers to compartment one. So now if you want to have a look as to what uh, type of distribution has been achieved, you can always go to the view option and have a view from the minus X direction. And this is the impulsive load that has been generated. Now, uh, for, similarly for the convective mode for uh, in compartment one, for uh, an acceleration in the positive Z direction uh, can be seen by selecting one of the load items that has been generated and you would see that this is the convective pressure distribution that has been generated by the Excel template. Now, of course, these values needs to be combined. They won't be acting individually. So as we know that the impulsive uh, mode or the impulsive modal load case would combine both the inertial uh, uh, pressure distribution and the impulsive hydrodynamic pressure distribution. So if I actually go into uh, load case number 100, remember that this is the load case number that we had specified in our Excel template and thus the seismic load that has been generated has started with load case number 100. 
And you'll see that there is a combination that has been done of uh, the various reference load items. So it has combined reference load case number 1000, and if we go up, reference load number 1000 indicates the inertial load in plus Z, and then it has combined reference load number 1002, which would mean that it has added the impulsive hydrodynamic uh, load for compartment one, and then 1006, which is the impulsive hydrodynamic loading for compartment two, and so on. Similarly, for uh, load case number 102, which is the convective uh, uh, mode hydrodynamic loading uh, has a combination of the convective hydrodynamic loading of all the compartments. Note that in this case, you will not have the inertial uh, load that would be generated. In this case, the load that is generated is pure, purely due to the sloshing of water. Now, these are the, the various load case that have been created, uh, which shows that the template is working very well, and um, it has generated a very complicated uh, load distribution, uh, which would have been very difficult to calculate by hand. Okay, I have one more uh, question for you to ask. Do you think the template that you just saw uh, will help uh, in your day-to-day -day work? It's just a couple of options, yes and no. So if you think the template that you just saw will help you, uh, please, uh, please answer that. Okay. Okay, thanks for your answer. And uh, let's uh, take the, take the, uh, Take it to the actually to the conclusion that what we what we actually showed it to you. Now that we have generated the impulsive and the convective model loads, we are now in the final phase of today's presentation, where we would combine the model loads. Our code IS one eight nine three part two two thousand and fourteen suggests and SRSS combination. And this is mostly uh, the way that the impulsive and the convective modes are combined around the world, except the Euro code, which suggests using an absolute summation rule. Now, we will discuss how to then use the load combination to do an SRSS combination of the modal loads. So before proceeding to do a model load combination, there is one last thing that I wanted to mention here. Uh, it is very important that we realize that this is nothing but a response spectrum analysis that we are trying to do. Instead of automating the response spectrum analysis through StatPro, we have generated the individual impulsive and convective model cases, and now we are going to combine the same. So all the limitations that was applicable for doing an automated response spectrum analysis in StatPro will still hold for this case. For example, we cannot use a tension compression support for this rectangular tank. Well, now that you are aware of the limitation, we will go ahead and combine the modal loads. Now we realize that load case number 100 uh, and load case number 102 are two modal load cases that needs to be combined because both are individual modal load cases that has been generated because of the seismic acceleration in the plus z direction. So 
how do we go ahead and combine these two modal load cases? Now, remember that we need to do an SRSS combination. So we go ahead and click on the define combination and let us define that as 104, load number is 104, and this is modal combination, let us name it as modal combination for seismic acceleration in plus Z, and uh, we intend to do an SRSS combination here, so we click on the SRSS, and then we go ahead and pick our load cases, 100, and ensure that this checkbox is ticked on, and 102, ensure that this checkbox is ticked on, and click on Add, and we have achieved the modal combination of the convective and impulsive modes from the acceleration in the plus Z direction. Now, the next thing that we need to do is to combine the impulsive and the convective mode for acceleration in the plus X direction. So, let us define another load combination, 105, and we say modal combination in plus X. It's an SRSS combination, and we combine 101 and 103. And check this boxes in, click on add, and we have defined the modal combination in plus X as well. Now, remember that these are, these are your final earthquake load cases, not the individual impulsive and convective modal load cases. They are not your final load cases for seismic. When you, what you'd call as a seismic load case would be this combined load case. That is load combination number 104 and load combination number 105. Now, the idea is that if you uh, run uh, the analysis, the results that would come out of it would be all positive, absolute values because of the SRSS combination. So let us try that. Let us go into the text editor and um, for one of the modal load combination, let us type in from analysis command and uh, say one of the modal load combination is load load combination 104. So we give a load is 104 and we just specify a support reaction printing. The idea is that all of this load would come out to be absolute positive, which would not have if our uh, if the combination had not been SRSS. So, okay, now we would now run the analysis. Now remember that though we have specified the support as plate mat, we have not specified the compression only command there or the compression command there. So it would just behave as normal spins. Uh, as uh, response spectrum wouldn't support iteration, else the modal load case uh, would become unstable, which would lead to problems in analysis. Okay, so that's why uh, we have to be very careful that we do not transgress the limitations that are specified for response spectrum analysis. Okay, now let us go to uh, the output file. Okay, and um, if we go to the support reaction printing, you will see that all the support reaction values are absolute values as as we would get from any response spectrum uh, load case. All right, so this is how you specify uh, the model combination uh, for for the impulsive and the convective mode.
Okay, I have one more quick question for you. What other codes do you require for a seismic analysis of water retaining structures? So what we have done is for Indian code, but we want to know is if you require a CI code or EC8 code or any other codes. So please, uh, please check on on the on the box. And please know that um, the result interpretation uh, of what we have shown today will be discussed in the next session, which will be delivered on 9th of September. And I, and I think it is time that I'll hand over to the second presenter of today, Rajendra Best, uh, for, for his uh, uh, session on the foundations of these structures. Good morning, everyone. I am Rajendra Bist, Application Engineer for uh, Geotechnical Products in Bentley Systems. And uh, for today's session, I'll discuss about the foundation of water and wastewater structures from a geotechnical engineering point of view. So often, uh, the structural engineer use the software in which the structure is modeled in detail but the subsoil is represented with a simple structural element which describes the behavior of soil poorly. Even though the structure was designed properly with a very high factor of safety, but uh, if you don't have a good understanding of soil behavior, then uh, that could lead to failure. The proper representation of soil behavior in modeling is important when you are dealing with a large infrastructure project for public service with a very large investment. This is the outline of uh, today's presentation. Uh, first, I will introduce you to the Bentley Geotechnical Engineering Solutions. Then I'll speak about uh, modeling of shallow foundation and uh, uh, how you can model the raft or a base slab of water, wastewater uh, tank uh, using the plate or a volume element in Plexis, uh, which is a geotechnical engineering software. Then uh, I will discuss about uh, total and differential settlement of the raft uh, that you can get uh, as the output from Plexis program. And after that, uh, the consolidation analysis and its importance. Then uh, I will move to part C of the presentation, uh, which is modeling of a pile foundation using volume or embedded beam. And uh, also uh, I'll discuss about how to get structural forces in the piles. So first uh, I'll start with the Bentley Geotechnical Engineering Solutions. Bentley system offers a range of uh, geotechnical uh, products uh, that provide a solution for any kind of uh, geotechnical problems. So here uh, we have two categories of uh, geotechnical product. The first is the geotechnical analysis and the second is geotechnical information management. And uh, under the geotechnical analysis category, uh, we have three product. First is Plexis 2D and 3D Connect Edition. And uh, this is a finite element based product uh, developed for analysis of deformation stability and the groundwater flow in soil and rocks. Next is the Plexis Monopile Designer. And uh, this product is mainly used in analysis and design of uh, offshore foundations. And uh, the third product is Plexis 2D and 3D LE, uh, which is a limit equilibrium based product, a very popular tool for uh, slope stability analysis. And uh, you can also perform groundwater uh, flow and consolidation analysis using Plexis LE. Now, uh, the second category is geotechnical information management. And under this, uh, there are three products uh, that are GINT, Kinetics, and Open Ground. 
These products are mainly used for collecting, reporting, managing, uh, visualizing, and analysis of uh, in situ and laboratory test data. So for this session, we will be focusing on geotechnical analysis category and mainly on Plexus 2D and 3D Connect Edition. Now uh, the question comes is uh, what exactly does Plexus do? So uh, Plexus is a finite element software developed for the analysis of deformation, stability, and groundwater flow in geotechnical engineering. Uh, it is a very user-friendly, robust, and reliable uh, finite element tool using which you can create an uh, efficient geotechnical model very fast. And uh, it has a comprehensive library of advanced uh, material model uh, for modeling of uh, soil and rocks. And uh, as you can see uh, in this figure, how you can use the software for uh, different geotechnical problems from foundation to tunneling to excavation problem. And uh, we can uh, model uh, other problems also. Using this tool, uh, you can get a reliable assessment of stress and displacement in soil and rock. And uh, it has a very uh, powerful and versatile uh, post-processing, which give a detailed result using which you can find uh, internal structural forces displacement, stress, and flow. Now, uh, moving to part B of the presentation, uh, which is modeling of shallow foundation. Now, uh, let me first show you a video uh, of how you can import a tank model from ISM to Plexus 3D. And uh, this tank model is something uh, that you have created in Stat Pro. So uh, ISM or Integrated Structural Model uh, is a technology for sharing uh, structural engineering project information among uh, structural modeling analysis, design drafting, and uh, detailing applications. And uh, Plexus 3D can exchange uh, structural information with the Integrated uh, Structural Model uh, repositories. So uh, to use this feature, uh, you should have the uh, ISM enabled uh, softwares. So uh, you have to choose ISM from uh, the file menu, and then you can uh, start the configure a remote scripting server. And uh, this will open your ISM uh, window, and you can choose the ISM file. And here, uh, you have to select all the structural element uh, that uh, you want to import. And now uh, you can see uh, we have the tank model uh, that we have imported in Plexus 3D from the ISM repository. The uh, top figure is showing the uh, model of tank and soil. And uh, in Plexus, uh, there are two ways of modeling raft or the base slab of water wastewater tank. First, uh, using the continuum or the volume element, and uh, second, uh, using the plate element. And uh, the plate element is uh, usually preferable uh, when you have a very flexible raft, and you can get all the structural forces of the raft easily using the plate element. And here, uh, the soil is modeled uh, using the uh, soil model that represents the soil behavior uh, more uh, realistically. And in Plexus, we do have a very advanced soil model that you can use for modeling of any kind of soil behavior. The uh, fluid weight in the tank produce a uniform uh, surcharge on the tank foundation. And uh, in Plexus, uh, you can model the fluid weight uh, as the uniformly distributed load. Now, uh, the uniformly distributed load uh, due to the tank contents uh, result in settlement of foundation and the foundation can experience uh, either uh, the uniform settlement or a differential settlement uh, depending on the flexibility of the raft and the uh, type of soil or the soil strength. The figure on the right-hand side uh, top is showing the total or the average settlement of the raft, and the bottom is showing the differential settlement. And here you can see the center of the raft settled more as compared to its edges. And uh, these are the output uh, that you can get from the plexus. 
and uh, uh, these are the settlement uh, uh, immediately after the construction of the tank now uh, the structures are usually designed for a design service life of 50 to 75 years and uh, during this period uh, there should not be any excessive settlement so a uh, consideration should also be given to the uh, long term settlement of the structure during its service life the long term settlement of foundation uh, can be determined using the consolidation analysis in plexis and in plexis uh, there is a option to enter the time interval also so you can run the consolidation analysis for the time period of uh, 50 to 75 years also now uh, the right hand side figure Uh, is showing you the curve for uh, settlement versus time and uh, this settlement include uh, immediate settlement and uh, settlement uh, due to the consolidation of soil so you can see here uh, immediately after construction the foundation settled by 30 to 35 mm but uh, uh, with the increase in time the settlement reached to up to 80 mm so for any structure the long term settlement should also be considered in plexis uh, we can choose the node and uh, get the displacement uh, for that particular node and uh, that displacement uh, you can use back in stair as the uh, displacement load and uh, do the further analysis but uh, you have to uh, make sure uh, that the position of the node point is same uh, in the model uh, in both the stat and the plexis program here are the output uh, that you can get uh, directly from plexis uh, so uh, using the plexis program uh, you are modeling this soil more realistically and uh, uh, then uh, you can determine the ultimate load carrying capacity and uh, the total and uh, differential settlement and also Uh, get the structural forces of foundation such as axial force uh, shear force or the bending moment now uh, moving to the final part of the presentation uh, which is uh, modeling of piles in plexis there are mainly uh, two methods of uh, modeling of pile in plexis uh, the first one is by modeling the pile as volume so uh, the volume pile uh, composed of a volume elements or a wall element Uh, with the pile property and here uh, we are physically uh, simulating the pile and uh, using the interface element uh, we can account for interaction between pile and the surrounding soil and uh, this is considered as the most accurate uh, representation of pile uh, for the soil structure interaction and uh, also uh, in case of the hollow pile uh, you can also use the plate element for pile modeling but uh, the volume pile has some limitations it requires large number of element and uh, when you want to model a large pile group the number of uh, element will be too large and uh, analysis of the model uh, will be very difficult and also because of the circular shape the mesh quality uh, will not be good the uh, piles can also be uh, modeled using the embedded uh, beams option in plexis and uh, an uh, embedded beam uh, composed of a beam element uh, that can be placed in arbitrary direction in soil and uh, inter interact with the soil by means of uh, special uh, interface element and uh, the interaction uh, with soil uh, involved uh, skin as well as the uh, tip resistance and uh, they are determined by relative displacement between a uh, soil and the pile the uh, embedded beam uh, does not occupy any volume but uh, a particular volume around the uh, pile is assumed and uh, this volume is considered as the uh, elastic uh, zone and uh, the size of this zone uh, is uh, equivalent to the pile diameter so using the embedded beam option you can model uh, large pile groups uh, without uh, affecting the mesh quality of the model so uh, this figure is showing a small uh, pile group model using volume element 
and uh, the volume pile is usually preferable when you are modeling a single pile or a small pile group but uh, you have to make sure and that the mesh quality is good uh, in the model and uh, here uh, you can see a very large uh, pile group modeled using the uh, embedded beams option in plexis and uh, embedded beams are efficient way of modeling large number of piles uh, with uh, a large soil element as compared to uh, the size of pile diameter this figure uh, showing the output uh, that you can get directly from plexis and here uh, you have the displacement uh, when a large uh, pile group is installed below the uh, raft uh, here uh, you can also determine the uh, load carrying capacity of the foundation and also the different uh, settlements in the case uh, when you are modeling pile using uh, embedded beam option uh, you can get the uh, structural forces uh, such as axial force shear force and uh, bending movement directly and also the uh, pile movement so these figures uh, here are showing the axial forces and the axial displacement of pile with this uh, i would uh, finish my presentation here and uh, thank you for your time and attention okay so before we jump off to the question and answer session um i have a very important question to ask uh if you have faced or you might have faced the geotechnical uh, geotechnical challenges uh, while working on the water wastewater structures foundation so if if you have faced so those challenges uh, like to know those and uh, you can uh, you can let us know uh, which challenges you have faced okay so i'll give a about a minute for you to type in okay and uh, then i i like to also tell you that on the 9th of september we'll be covering the third session of this series uh, which is the design of water and wastewater structures in stat connectorations so it will be focused on the design part of it so it's on 9th of september if you have not registered it we probably have sent it uh the links to you uh to all of you please do register for the 9th september event and i'll leave it uh you with uh, just a uh, last poll question it is uh, if you like the presentation of today would you like uh us to contact you or our sales representative to contact you so you can answer that okay so i think it is time that i uh take the questions uh, i think uh, uh, me and my colleagues have rented uh, relentlessly been trying to answer your questions and most of them we we actually answered but there are very uh, important questions uh, that i i i think i like to take so one of the question uh, which was asked uh, by by a user is how do we get this excel template So I'll ask uh, my colleague uh, Sudip Narayan Chaudhary to come up here and uh, answer this question. Hello, everyone. Uh, so basically, the Excel template uh, is available. Generally, it is supposed to be available on a, a location that we have created in Bentley communities, but. this particular template um i'm afraid you have to wait uh, because we are just doing some uh, minor refining in the functions that was uh, used in this excel template so currently the current version is um, u7 which is uh, uh, which has just been released so in a couple of months we would be releasing u8 in which you would be refining an openstat function that was 
uh, used in this particular template. So as soon as U8 is released, we will make uh, this template available to all of you. Uh, just an important point to note here is that um, currently this template reads out from the physical modeler. Uh, so you would need to, if you want to use this template, the way that it reads out the the walls of uh, the rectangular tank uh, for the generation of the impulsive and convective hydrodynamic pressure, uh, it uh, it has to be, it, it reads out information that is generated by the stat pro physical modeler. So there are two prerequisites in that sense that you, for this template to work currently, uh, you need to War, uh, you need to develop the model uh, from the physical modeler. That's number one. Number two is, of course, you need to have the latest U8 version. The um, because, uh, as I've said, that we originally intended that uh, it should be available in uh, U7, which has just been released. But unfortunately, um, uh, you know, there were uh, we felt that there uh, would be necessity for some. Uh, a minor uh, uh, refining of the OpenStat function. So once we do that, we will release that in U8. Uh, all of those who have attended this session and th those who will attend this session on demand, uh, we will send you an email uh, once the U8 is released and also the link uh, as to where this template is posted. I hope that answers the question. Back to you, Kaushal. Yeah, so there is now a very uh, kind of a technical question being asked. Uh, what are the multiplying factors in the equations for evaluating the horizontal seismic coefficient? I think it's a it's a question for you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th yeah, this is a very good question, and I'm sorry I should have covered that in uh, in my presentation itself. So the multiplying factors, so if you actually look into clause 4.4 of the IS-1893 part two code, the codes is suggesting a damping of 0.5% for convective modes for all types of liquids. And um, the impulsive mode damping is uh, recommended to be taken as 2% for steel tanks and 5% for masonry tanks. Now, uh, you might have noticed that the response spectrum data, the spectral acceleration data that we uh, we are using in these equations are being generated from the part one of IS-1893 code, which is based on a 5% damping. So obviously you would need to make some adjustments for these various values of damping that has been recommended. So accordingly, um, let me uh, just have a look into the uh, code. So if you actually look into clause 4.5.2 of, uh, of the part two code, you will see that because of this um, damping factor being different or the different damping factors will be recommended then one, we are sorting out the spectral acceleration form. The from the the code uh, the code has suggested a multiplying factor uh, of uh, one for five percent. That is for concrete or masonry tanks. You need to have a multiplying factor for one. For two percent, it's one point four. So the, for the steel tanks, you need to have a multiplying factor of one point four. And for the convective mode, for all type of liquid, it has suggested 0.5% damping, which is equivalent to a multiplying factor of 1.75. Now, we use these multiplying factors to uh, to modify the design horizontal coefficient that is being calculated based on a, a, a response spectrum curve based on 5% damping. So I hope that answers the question. Back to you, Kaushal. I think so that answers the question very well. So next question is, in case of circular water tank, tower type, the IS code explained in this webinar, can we can be applied for the seismic case? Um, say it's come with a question mark. So I think uh, you, yeah. if you have understood the question. Yes. Okay. So okay. Basic, basically, uh, the 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 uh, the question that has been asked here is whether if, if it can be explained for circular water tanks one, and I think uh, they are also uh, asking for an elevated um, 
type of a circular water tank. So, uh, no, uh, this one is specifically meant for rectangular tanks. For circular tanks, there needs to be a radial function that needs to be considered as well. Uh, so that hasn't been uh, considered here. So uh, this is, uh, and even for the elevated water tanks, uh, there are separate recommendations, uh, which we will take care of hopefully in the, so we, this is the water wastewater series part one. Uh, we plan to do a part two series uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in quarter one of uh, 2022. And we are hoping that uh, we will uh, we will take care of uh, this uh, circular water tanks and also the elevated water tanks in that session. Back to you, Kosha. Okay, uh, I have one more question for Rajendra this time. How to consider soil structure interaction? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kaushal. And uh, that's a very uh, interesting question, I would say. So uh, because of the time constraint, uh, we couldn't show you the full uh, ISM workflow. So uh, what happens is that uh, whenever you model a, a structure or a superstructure in your uh, structure software, uh, you can uh, export that uh, model and uh, export that model to the ISM. And then from the ISM, Plexis can import that model. And uh, in Plexis, we can uh, do the analysis and get you the ground response. And based on that ground response, uh, you can get the uh, displacement uh, at uh, uh, different nodes or at uh, different points uh, uh, in your model. And that uh, uh, displacement uh, you can use as the uh, uh, displacement uh, support loads uh, in your uh, STAT program. So uh, this is one way of uh, you know considering the uh, soil structure interaction, and uh, uh, it's a it's a very uh, uh, simple process. Uh, but uh, because of the time constraint, we couldn't show you the full uh, uh, extent of this process here. And uh, maybe in future uh, we can uh, do something on that. And uh, there are a few uh, webinars also uh, on demand webinars. Uh, that you can uh, refer to uh, for uh, more information on this ISM workflow. Over to you, Kaushal. Thanks, Rajendra. Okay, I have a very important question uh, coming up for uh, Sudeep, uh, Sudeepda. So, should the seismic analysis be carried out for every water retaining, for which case can we neglect the effect of seismic forces? Okay, that's uh, that's a good question. See, um, of course, like I would suggest that uh, you should consider this um, uh, for uh, sort of every um, every water <clears throat> uh, wastewater structures. But uh, but again, the final decision, of course. See, the hydrodynamic issues have uh, an impact when uh, actually there is a movement of the water particles. Um, it um, compounds the forces uh, on the structure, uh, but uh, yeah, there, there, uh, and you would see that generally for all uh, usable tanks, uh, the code suggests a, an importance factor of 1.5, which um, uh, you know you should, uh, which probably shows the importance of uh, considering the hydrodynamic analysis for water tanks. But if there are some tanks uh, uh, where you feel that uh, there is no risk to public life or there won't be any consequences to you know the environment society and economy uh, it's your decision whether you want to uh, uh, but uh, if you ask me i will absolutely absolutely go for it you know for such type of tanks that i've just mentioned uh, the importance factor suggested in the code is one so you should at least go for uh, a hydrodynamic analysis with with one uh, with importance factor of one that uh, that is what i would suggest you know I, it's um, it would be very difficult but yeah absolutely yes if uh, it is something that uh, that is uh, uh, that is um, that affects public life or it's uh, hazardous to uh, the environment, uh, uh, the economy. You have to have to consider the hydrodynamic effects. Yes. 
Okay, I have a couple more questions. I try to rephrase them into one. So, uh, in future, can we have the hydrodynamic pressure template for elevated water tanks, buried tanks, or maybe the partially buried tanks? Right. So, again, um, for the elevated tanks, definitely, definitely yes. Uh, for uh, the uh, the buried tanks, when you talk of buried tanks, again, you have to talk about the shape of the tanks, whether it's a circular tank or whether it's a rectangular tank. Uh, that is one. Uh, we intend to actually reach out to our users who are already using uh, Stat Pro in water wastewater structures in order to understand in order to understand better how they're using it for uh, the buried tanks. Uh, we haven't um, given the information on buried tanks in this particular session. We have uh, sort of considered the, uh, the tank to be overground. But uh, once we have a discussion uh, with them, because see, the code, I haven't found any recommendations as such uh, as to what needs to be considered for buried tanks, OK? Uh, uh, there could be um, compounded soil effects as well uh, uh, with the tank pushing on the uh, on the soil. But I would like to find out uh, from uh, from users who had been in this industry for a long time uh, as to what effects could we have on buried tanks. But of course, yeah, uh, we um, uh, we intend to do the. Uh, the elevated tanks, no doubt about it. But buried tanks, you know, we are still doing a bit of research on what um, what it is going to be um, uh, and what what the literature around the world says. Uh, we I, I don't uh, claim that we have done a very um, uh, good research on the buried tanks, but uh, and that's why we have uh, kept it aside for. Uh, the next uh, water wastewater series part two, where we'll do some more study, uh, we'll talk to the users who are already using Stat Pro, and, and get back uh, with a more informed decision on uh, you know if the buried tanks are required or not. But we'll definitely mention that in the second uh, or the uh, the part two of the water wastewater series. Okay, uh, we are getting few more questions, but I think for for them we will. Um, we will need a bit of a study and even, you know, may need to take some screenshots uh, to answer them. Uh, so I think uh, we can uh, we can conclude this session for today. Uh, and I thank both of our presenters, Rajinder Best and uh, Sudip Narayan Chaudhary. And I thank you all the participants who have stayed with us, uh, though we spilled over a little bit. And I thank you all for your patient listening uh thanks and we'll see you in the next session bye bye